I've always been a frog enthusiast. People ask me why, and I don't really have a good answer, except that since I was really young, that's what I did. I'd go outside, I'd catch frogs, I'd name them. I used to put them in kiddie pools and swim with them, try to figure out how they swam. <laughs> since then, it's kind of grown into this intense curiosity that I've turned to science to really have an opportunity to explore. Inside Science. So most people, when they ask me, how do, you, how do you catch a poison frog, they think I'm wearing some kind of mask or, or gloves. But the reality is that we're much bigger than poison frogs, and the amount of toxins that they have is pretty small. So there's only a couple poison frogs that I would wear gloves or be really cautious about. It can be sometimes challenging to find frogs, and my general approach has been, generally I rent a car, and I turn down the windows, turn off the music, tell everyone in the car to be quiet, and just drive really slowly. What you hear is, is choruses of these frogs calling. So the males call to attract female mates, and females go around, they choose the sexiest call. So males are sitting around calling, and the surprising thing is often you end up catching a female, not the male that was calling. And that's because the female is, is within usually about a foot of the male, kind of checking them out. And the males tend to call from under leaves, so they're, they're hidden. They don't want to be exposed. You can coax them into small water bottles that are clear, so they're, you know, they're not that smart. Generally, I don't work with the most toxic poison frogs. These are, they're called the golden poison frog. The poster child is Phyllobates terribilis. It's known for the quantity of toxins that it has, and in that one I would be very hesitant to pick up. Inside Science. If you enjoyed this edition, follow us on the web and social media. Powered by the American Institute of Physics and a coalition of underwriters.